Good morning. It's July 14th, 2022, Thursday. It's still Stampede Week. You can tell because I'm wearing this hideous hat as a means to get out of wearing a necktie. I can get away with this for one more working day and I'm going to take full advantage of it. Maybe we'll get some more rodeo events or something where I can do a little more of that. So thank you for tuning in today, guys. Those of you who aren't out on the midway, it's good to see the comments coming. This is where I like to remind folks, yes, use that comment scroll. Good to see you there, Randy. And, uh, you know, Send questions my way, chat back and forth, send questions towards my guests. We won't necessarily get to them all, but uh, it's good to see that interactivity and know that there's a, there's a live conversation going there. That's what makes live worthwhile. You know, recording stuff, we can record it. It's easier. It's easier for scheduling and all the rest, but you don't have that fluid sort of show going on, and we don't have that interaction. So, And it, I just like seeing it. So I know I'm actually talking to people across the country. we got Kevin out there in Ontario, and Linda, ironically named East, but is coming from the West in B.C., as well as Pamela. So, and uh, Samantha out in Grand Prairie. Let's see here. We got a few things to observe today as folks check in. Make sure to keep a track on. And that's, it's Bastille Day. That's the big French Independence Day. That's that's their 4th of July. That's their Canada Day equivalent. The, the funny thing was, and if you follow me on uh, Twitter at all, again, that's where I get going. And I saw that pop up this morning. Justin Trudeau wishing France a happy Bastille Day. And I couldn't help but laugh. And people, if you're familiar with the French Revolution, the Bastille was a prison where political prisoners were all jammed in there for speaking up against the government and things such as that. Though the Marquis de Sade, I believe, was in there too for much grosser reasons than that. But either way, the French Revolution, they stormed the Bastille, they freed the prisoners, and of course, uh, you know, the, the, those French aristocrats were all uh, taken down in, in terrible ways, mostly because they'd lost touch with the public. They were, again, eating cake whilst the rest were starving, and uh, they were locking up political prisoners. So I had to tweet at Justin Trudeau, uh, that perhaps you should study what that's about and see why it happened, and you may want to consider uh, those sorts of things. And then I had to follow up and said, no, I know Justin's not going to read it. I said, I'm sorry, there's no uh, pop-up book on the French Revolution, but get somebody to read it for you, and it might spare you some, some pain down the road. Okay, it's also International Nude Day. That's on an upside. Uh, this is the day, I guess, you want to get out there and, and hang out what you got hanging, or uh, as you get older like me, there's parts that just kind of dangle or, or whatnot, but this is the day to celebrate it. Get out there, sunburn your spots, horrify your neighbors or titillate them. I guess it depends on what they're into. Somebody has determined that this is the day for it. So this is the day to get out there. I, and uh, careful, I think there's still laws applying to streaking around unless you're in some sort of specialty parade. But if you're really got to insist on doing that, today's the day to do it. Finally, it is National Tape Measure Day. And I think that kind of can Cut in with that national nude day as well. If you've got something to be proud of that you're, uh, you know, I, I unfortunately wasn't gifted. It, even if I ran around nude, it's a, it's a pretty modest thing there. I, I like to think uh, uh, I had good fortune in many ways, but no, I'm not one of those who's going to pretend to have something uh, exceptional. But if you do, get that tape measure out there and hit the nude day and show off to the world what you were granted with. All right. Let's see. I got a couple of good guests on talking about things other than nudity and, uh, uh, other uh, such things. Uh, Phoebe Long with Put Your Clothes Back on Ethel. That's a quote from the old song, The Streak, if we want to go way back and date me. So any of us old enough to remember that song probably shouldn't be out in public nude. All right. So we got David Clement uh, of the Consumer Choice Center. He's going to be talking to us about uh, airline fares. I mean, in Canada, we are paying through the nose. We are getting hit hard and it's due to a lack of competition, among other things. So we'll talk about that. David's been on before. He's a good guy. And independent MLA for Cypress Medicine Hat, Drew Barnes, is going to be on. He's uh, still there, and he's working hard, and he's standing up for his constituents. One of his constituents is Tamara Leach. We're going to talk about those provincial issues. You know, we shouldn't forget while there's a leadership race going on, there's still our representatives speaking up on issues out there, and Drew is one of them. All right, let's get on to what I'm ranting about today. And I'm going to begin with one of my favorite pastimes, and that's patting myself on the back. So back in mid-September of 2021, I tweeted... As per Economics 101, inflation is setting in due to massive borrowing on the part of the state. So lesson two out of that. Do you know what the central bank will eventually do in response? And if you answered hike interest rates, you're correct, and you've won a path to a prolonged recession. So I predicted an inflationary trend in the central bank's response to, to it. Am I a gifted fortune teller, a modern-day Nostradamus? No, I'm afraid not. I, I just have a basic economics understanding, even if our prime minister doesn't. 
The third part of my prediction will be coming soon as the blunt instrument of hiking interest rates sends the economy into a recession. And it's not just economic principles guiding me in my predictions. It's remembering what happened the last time the government borrowed itself to the brink of insolvency and dealt with the issue with interest hikes. Historic events, unfortunately, tend to be a circular thing. We forget and we repeat things, particularly with economic trends. Inflation was high and high energy prices were rampant in the 1980s when Trudeau Sr. was Canada's prime minister. And rather than cut spending, Trudeau hammered the economy with high interest rates and attacked the energy sector. The result was an economic collapse in Alberta as Albertans literally walked away from their homes because they couldn't make mortgage payments with such high interest rates while the economy was in the toilet. It was devastating. Today we are in the exact same economic conditions and we have another bloody Trudeau in power. This one's dumber than his father though by a number of magnitudes and it doesn't look good. In the 1990s, we had to correct the course of high spending governments on all levels. Alberta's government was little better than the federal one, actually. Premier Lougheed, Premier Getty, Getty, they used deficit financing and put the province deeply in the hole. In Ottawa, Chrétien had to cut spending and get the budget back in balance. Him and Martin were actually some of the most conservative uh, governments we ever had. In Alberta, Ralph Klein, of course, was the one to do it. The public sector unions held massive public temper tantrums and threatened strikes. They're predictable. In the end, though, the cuts had to happen. The cupboard was bare. Now we're going to be cutting government spending on all levels again. It's, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. The laws of economics, they're as immutable as those of gravity. The government can deny it all they like, but they're going to have to face the reality of ending borrowing and starting to cut eventually. We can't pretend we didn't see it coming. It feels like I'm shouting into the wind, but we should try and warn people and at least counsel some others to prepare. We need to start asking ourselves, what government services can we do without? And there's a lot of them. What's really essential? And what can we cut or eliminate? The Department of Heritage, you know, they could use some massive cuts. Or here's an easy one. We don't need the CBC. That's $1.4 billion a year. Liquidate all those buildings on top of that and uh, the vans and the equipment. And we can throw that towards the debt. We can cut foreign aid. Most of it's virtue signaling anyways, and it just goes to dictators to buy arms. Public art? No. No. It's not the government's role to buy us art. There's a lot of things. The Governor General's office. How about that? There's room there. They're all going to howl, but too damn bad. I mean, what's more important to you, maintaining then the universal health care or paying the governor general to keep globe trotting while pissing away $87,000 for in-flight meals for her friends? This all adds up. The cuts will come easier if we prepare for them now, because if we wait until there's no choice, it's going to come a lot harder. And if you're a civil servant, and I know a lot of them probably don't listen to this show, but you should think to yourself, is your job vital or could you be easily cut? And if it's the latter, and I know that's the case with many, you may want to prepare for a career change. The cuts won't be as bad as some think anyways. In the 1990s, you know, when Klein was cutting the civil service deeply, uh, most citizens, including myself, I remember, we didn't see a decline in government services. There was a lot of dead wood that needed to be flushed out of the halls of the government bureaucracy, and we were fine without them. It's likely a futile warning, but I have to try. Austerity is coming. Don't give me the opportunity to say I told you so again when things hit the fan. As much as I do, I admit I like saying it, I'll be perfectly happy if I don't. All right, well, there's my economics rant for the day. Let's get on to some news. <clears throat> we got somebody different in today. It's usually Dave Naylor coming in to chat with me, but today we have our intrepid reporter, Amanda Brown, bringing us up to date on what stories are topping the news right now and what's coming up. Hey, Amanda, how's it going? It's going very well, Corey. Thanks very much. I, uh, I remember you saying earlier that you didn't think that hat suited you very well, but I, I beg to differ. I think it looks fabulous on you. Well, I, I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, I've gotten mixed reviews from some people all around. To Jane, I, I know it's kind of weirded her out because, again, I rarely wear hats of any kind, so it just looks unusual sitting on my head. But uh, maybe as my hair keeps receding and graying, I might want to reconsider my fashion choices. But it costs you a pretty penny, I heard, as well. Yeah, yeah, because as I said, I, I foolishly went out to Lamley's shopping in the middle of Stampede Week, uh, just about as dumb a time as possible to buy a cowboy hat. Yeah, with good investment, and maybe maybe if you're lucky, you can get it paid on on, on uh, expenses. Oh yeah, I'll, I'll submit that one and uh, yeah. won't hold my breath. Uh, Melanie offered me her hat, and uh, but it's too small. I've got a big head, and unfortunately, uh, I'd be sitting here with you hatted, uh, but uh, not today. Ah, really um, nice yeah. I'm going to kick off with the uh, Health Canada has approved the Moderna mRNA vaccine for children aged six months to five years old. Um, in, that means that infants and preschoolers can now get the shot. Uh, the dose will be a quarter of uh, that of an adult. Um, the Pfizer vaccine is still under review with Health Canada at the moment. 
Um, that we're expecting uh, news on that pretty soon. Um, I'll be very interested to see what the uptake looks like uh, for the vaccine, given that the you know, given the fact that the COVID-19 hasn't impacted children of this age group in any substantial way. So I wonder what parents are, are going to feel about that. I know I know it will be popular with some parents, but uh, interest does seem to be waning. Um, healthcare workers uh, have been found to be some of the most reluctant to get the COVID vaccination, which may come as a surprise to some people and not really a surprise to other people. Um, I guess they see uh, what's what's going on in the hospitals. Um, the information comes from a Canadian Medical Association journal article that's titled Weak COVID Booster Campaign. Uh, the uh, results were originally from the British medical journal, the BMJ, uh, and that was a questionnaire that was sent out to more than 15,000 Canadian healthcare professionals. And uh, they responded and, uh, and, uh, and yes, they, uh, they're reluctant. Apparently only 55% of them, uh, more than, than, than some people might expect, but uh, less than others. But, uh, but that's similar to the US uh, when they were, were surveyed on the same questions. And uh, the British Medical, uh, sorry, the BMJ said that uh, most respondents cited their reason for hesitancy as being uh, the new technology that the, 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 these mRNA vaccines are using and uh, cited also safety concerns. So that's, uh, that's very interesting. I see if that, if, uh, you know, government, the, the federal government and the provincial government can change that because I'm sure they're going to try and uh, give those workers lots of incentives to change their mind. Uh, the governor of the Bank of England, Tiff Macklin, said yesterday that Canadians should expect a slowdown in the economy by winter, which won't be a surprise to a lot of people since we're all having to pull our belts tighter where everyone's a bit more skint than they used to be, for sure. Uh, they should expect that slowdown by winter. And, uh, have, well, that was Bank of Canada, not Bank of England. But, uh, did I say England? Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> those roots go. Well, I'm, sorry, Bank of Canada, yeah. And uh, they should expect to slow down by winter and uh, a continued high cost of living. So that's not much to look forward to, uh, including a, a winter, of course. Um, Tim Macklin uh, raised the Bank of Canada base rate by a full 1% yesterday, and that pushed the interbank loan rate to 2.5%. Um, and by Labor Day, they say inflation will be at 8%, which is uh, hot in the heels of uh, the U.S. inflation rate, which is at 9%, I think, uh, approximately. And uh, e unfortunately, the economic growth rate is predicted to fall from 3.5% to 1.75% by next year. Um, another new story unfolding is um, confidential documentation have been, has been released um, that reveal decisions in the process used to ease the pandemic res restrictions in the province. So the government, the um, Alberta government, fought to keep the documentation from going public, and they were citing that, that, that you know information in the in the documents, the 300 pages of documents, was actually confidential. But they were overruled by Gus, uh, Justice Grant Dunlop in in the lawsuit um, as it unfolded. Uh, the documentation included a PowerPoint presentation, presentation that was prepared by the Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dina Hinshaw, for Health Minister J, uh, David Copping, and, 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 and that offered guidance to the Alberta Health Service on phasing out, uh, sorry, the phasing in of the reopening and phasing out of restrictions. Um, the last lawsuit, uh, sorry, the, law, the lawsuit was initiated by the Alberta Federation of Labour and a number of parents of five um, Immune compromised, immune compromised children against the government of Alberta. And lastly, for my uh, you know new breaking news today is the uh, Canadian government has decided, in their wisdom, to reinstate random COVID nineteen testing. Uh, this time it will be offsite, for, uh, and the testing is for fully vaccinated air travellers, um, and that begins next Tuesday. So. Health Minister Jean-Yves Duclos said that they need to keep a tab on incoming COVID-positive travellers and uh, to be able to identify variants of concern as they come into Canada. Um, the random testing was only suspended a little over one month ago. Uh, the government said that moving testing off-site means it can better support Canadian travellers, although I'm not quite sure what they mean by that. Uh, sounds like a 
a pain in the proverbial to me, but uh, travelers will receive an email within 15 minutes of, uh, of submitting their customs declaration forms. And the email will give details about how to book an appointment and uh, find your, you know, the local test center where you'll need to go and, and to have that test taken. You know what I think, Corey? Mm. I think uh, that the federal government has a secret ministry of uh, frustration. And uh, I think it looks to me like they're doing overtime. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. I also would just suspect and speculate there's probably some people who have some really lucrative contracts for uh, COVID testing that uh, really wouldn't want to give up all those tests they invested in. Well, uh, absolutely. Well, it's frustrating. Yeah, we thought that testing was over. I mean, the airports are still a catastrophe. Our tourism industry is still in the toilet. And uh, here they are diving right back in to delay and harass our visitors all the more. Just seems to be no end to it. Yep, absolutely. Ongoing. All right. Well, thanks for all the updates today. Uh, I know there's plenty for you to cover when Dave's out of the house there. We've uh, you got big shoes to fill and there's lots of news breaking and going on. So I appreciate that. And we'll, we'll check in again after the show. Look forward to it. Thank you very much, Corey. Hey, thank you, Amanda. So, yes, as the Western Standards, Amanda Brown, a lot of those stories you see on there when you're reading them are from Amanda. And then on other days, she's pouring through and fixing up the copy from when we, uh, you know, torment Mike or uh, Amanda and the other people with our chronic spelling errors and grammatical uh, uh, atrocities at times. So I uh, have to appreciate Amanda's work. And as a reader, you guys should appreciate it too, the, the good stories. And as I said, that uh, copy editing, so we don't offend your eyes too much when we uh, mess with things out there. So lots breaking, lots being reported on, as we said. And, uh, Again, this is where I like to remind everybody the reason we've got Amanda, the reason we got Dave, the reason we've got people all across the country is from subscribers. We don't take any tax dollars, guys. We uh, rely completely on you. And that makes us accountable to you. Hey, if we're putting out crap, you guys aren't going to subscribe. And so far, obviously, we're doing something right because we've had thousands of subscriptions and we really appreciate it. This is how we can take down the establishment media that's... Uh, feeding you that terrible, terrible content out there, guys. But again, if you haven't subscribed already, get on there. It's 10 bucks a month, $99 for a year, well worth it. We're talking again, you know, if you look back, the price you used to pay for a newspaper subscription, this is even less than that. There's people who play video games online, pay subscriptions, it cost more than this, and we're getting much more out of that. So uh, again, get on there, take out a subscription, and those who have already, a hey, thank you. And if you're looking to advertise, Send me a note. You got a product or service? We can get that out there. We can promote things, guys. I'm going to talk about one of those in a sense uh, before we get to our guest as well. Just a reminder, if you go to Give, Send, Go, uh, it's one of those fundraising sites. And I mean, there, there, there was problems and everything, but they didn't roll over like GoFundMe did. There's one set up and it's approved by her lawyer. There's a fundraiser for Tamara Leash. And uh, bear in mind, you know, she's been locked up. She's uh, had her bail revoked on a petty uh, offense and she, she can't pay her bills. She's not working right now. Of course, who could, right? So those who want to help her out, make sure she can pay her bills. So, I mean, whatever other crap the government's putting her through and, and the abuses that are being heaped upon her, at least she doesn't have to stay awake at night and wonder how the bills are going to be paid. So if you want to help her out, get out there, search Give, Send, Go, and search the name Tamara Leach or look at my Twitter account. I've got links to it out there. And uh, give her a hand, guys. We can't let the government push down citizens like that and, and punish them for, for exercising democratic rights. And uh, perhaps my next guest, uh, he, you know, Tamara is one of his constituents. Uh, he might uh, lend a little more on that in, in a moment when he's ready to come in there. And that's Drew Barnes. He's the independent MLA for Cyprus Medicine Hat. And he's, he's been good and outspoken. Sometimes there's advantages of being independent. Uh, he can, uh, it's like we're as an independent media outlet. I rely on your subscribers. Well, Drew, he answers to his constituents. So let's bring him in and have a chat and see what's going on out there in eastern Alberta. Hey, Drew. Hey, Corey Morgan, how are you? Nice to talk to you. Happy Stampede. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I see you're westerned up. So what, you guys can embrace it all the way out in Medicine Hat there? Yeah, we sure do. I've actually been in Calgary for a couple days. And uh, of course, our uh, Stampede's not till July 27th, but it's usually a good three or four days here. And it's, uh, it's a special time. See a lot of old friends. Right on. Yeah. Well, and we, we're really due for, you know, some good socializing, just enjoying life again. We've had such a challenging couple of years and we, you know, everybody in cities and towns across the province looks forward to their annual uh, events and things such as that. So, yeah. And Corey, like the rodeo was sold out in Calgary when I was there. A couple of the cocktail parties were jam packed. It, it Things were really going well, I thought, for everyone. 
Great. So, uh, yeah, lots of political events, lots of uh, hobnobbing going on. Uh, it's been <laughs> something. Um, I, you know, I mean, that's part of why I'm looking at maybe for some of your observations. I mean, you're independent right now, but it gives you kind of a different lens to look at things. We've got two different races going on between conservative parties, in a sense. Uh, how do things look for Albertans as we watch this sort of stuff going on? Well, you know, there, there, there is some silver lining in what have been some gray clouds. And let's start with Ottawa, first of all. You know, the fact that $25 billion a year goes out of Alberta, the fact that in, in exchange for that, they deny us resource movement and deny us fairness. Um, but having said that, when I look at, uh, you know, all five of the Conservative Party of Canada leadership candidates and, and you know, and Pierre Polyev in the last little while and, and even John Charest with his Alberta Accord, uh, Rick Bell's article uh, yesterday, Pierre has some strong pro-Alberta statements in there, which I thought he had been neglecting to say, but, but talking about fairness and ending equalization and, and making things happen. So, yeah, so, I mean... Alberta is more on the radar in, in the Conservative Party of Canada than ever before. Um, will it make any difference? You know, all those I'll say to, to the Ottawa, Corey, is it had better. Uh, separation, independence, desire, desire for change has risen dramatically in Alberta. And uh, at some point in time, Ottawa is going to have to do something to give us equality and fairness, give us resource movement, or, or it's going to get much worse. Um, when I look at the Alberta race, um, I'm I'm disappointed that it's underachieved so far. And and Corey, though I am so not surprised, Jason Kenney, when he didn't go away, when he didn't allow an intern leader to be appointed, uh, he still got his thumbs on, on the scales of this leadership race. And, and of course, there's you know there's some discussion about whether Danielle Smith is is going to be allowed to to fully enter it. The hundred seventy five thousand dollars was. You know, I got into politics with you in the Wild Rose in 2011 to keep big money out of politics. 175000 that, you know, I believe you can self-fund it and then raise it later is putting big money into politics. It's not the, the and, and of course, our candidates now, uh, the vast majority of them have been spending time focused on that rather than out uh, shaking hands, kissing babies and, and talking ideas with Albertans. Um, so again, I, I, I just see the UCP, you know, shoot themselves in the foot all the time. And, and so far this race is the same way. Yeah, I mean, it just smacks of a bit of elitism. I mean, I understand the purpose of a bar. Absolutely. I understand the purpose of an elections committee to say to some people, perhaps, you know, you're not appropriate to run. Uh, when, I, when I ran for an NDP nomination to sort of poke fun at them, I wasn't <laughs> yeah. shocked that they told me to get stuffed when I put in my paperwork, but they have the right to do that. But then when it gets arbitrary, when it gets, and, and when you're using a, a fiscal bar, I mean, there's no doubt about it. I mean, if it was even, say, 50,000, you're going to be pretty serious before you lay out that kind of money to run for a leadership. But when you're getting all the way up to 175,000, that's their way of saying we don't want the commoners in this race. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and hey, let's talk Bill Rock, the one gentleman that had to, to you know, drop out. Uh, Amisk, Alberta is not anywhere near my constituency, but nobody has called me more over the last five years with ideas and concerns about rural crime more than Mayor Bill. And uh, his voice would have been good in there. He has some great ideas. He knows firsthand a lot of the real pressure points. And as you were talking about Tamara Leach, uh, who is from Medicine Hat, you know, you know, what is she now, 40 days in jail for mischief when the rest of our legal system is all about catch and release? Uh, I mean, it's, it's so sad to see the Internet and Twitter flooded with stories of people that have committed serious crimes and are right back out. And, 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 and Tamara's for mischief is in her 40th day. And, and who knows when that next bail trial, bail hearing will happen. Uh, but anyway, so so Bill Bill had a good voice. Bill's ideas would have would have made Alberta stronger. And uh, yeah, you know, you you have to have a bar somewhere, but 175,000 is ridiculous. And, and potentially we'll see more drop out. But again, I think what it's meant so far is the first three weeks has been all about raising money, you know, rather than discussing ideas. Um, so to me, the, the UCP leadership race has been a very underachieving so far. That is too bad. I, I had a couple of commenters, and I, I don't, uh, you know, expect you to dive in on, on individual candidates so much, but it's an interesting concept that got thrown out. And, and you started that, like alienation, the Western issues are finally in the focus, even on the federal front and definitely on the provincial front. 
And a couple of commenters are wondering, though, what you think of the proposed Alberta Sovereignty Act, or just, I guess, we could expand more than somebody else's specific policy, but uh, just the proposed policies on how to deal with Alberta standing up for itself against uh, Eastern incursions, you know, wh which route might work best within a provincial scope? Well, well, thank you, Corey. Yeah, I, I, I quite like the initiative itself. Here, here's, here's one of the, the leadership candidates with, with a good chance of, of success, bringing this idea forward, um, bringing this idea forward to, to cause a constitutional crisis, to open up the Constitution and, and force our Canadian partners to, to either give us fairness or, or maybe let us out, out someday. And really what it's all about is whatever Quebec has, Alberta should have as well. So, so that is hard to disagree with. Why, why shouldn't all 10 be, be treated equal? Um, but, you know, whether it comes to the Sovereignty Act or shutting off the taps, um, all these things are going to cause some unintended hardship and they're doing some things that are, that are out of our control. So when I came out with my dissenting opinion, when I was on the fair deal panel, and, and again, I'm so grateful that thousands of Albertans reached out to us and me with, with their ideas. I think I came up with some things that are all within Alberta's control. We need to have our own pension. It's $3 billion that would make it so seniors could afford their utilities here. We need to collect our own taxes. Um, you know, what we pay to Ottawa in interest and penalties alone would, would cover the cost of collecting the taxes and, and, and we'd have more, more say. We need control over immigration. We need our own policing. Uh, we, we, need, we need to put in the infrastructure closer to the grassroots, close, closer to local decision making and, and where, where Alberta has control. But Corey, the main thing I said then was three years from now, we should have an independence referendum. We should tell Ottawa today. Yes, we want to be part of Canada, but only if we get a fair deal and only if we get resource movement and free trade. You guys have three years to figure it out, three years to open up the Constitution, three years to put in the corridors and get the pipeline access and do what you need to do. And three years from now, we're going to have give Albertans the chance to hold you accountable. We're going to have an independence referendum and Albertans can decide if it's if it's time to to you know, turn up the heat if it's time to go or if we're happy enough with, with the deal that was proposed. Uh, like, unlike turning off the taps, which certainly has elements of unconstitutionality, uh, unlike, uh, you know, Danielle and, and the Freedom Alberta's group on the, on the Sovereignty Act, I mean, that has a lot of, a lot of issues that dance around, around legalities. Uh, to me, I thought this was cleaner and, and more direct. We, you know, we're going to give you three years to give us a fair deal. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm just hope that once we get past this this uh, leadership race that these things can be discussed fully and and i'm grateful in my 10 years that uh you know we can put alberta first yeah well there's no doubt that the status quo isn't cutting it and and maybe uh uh perhaps a referendum i you know i i think maybe we have to wait a little longer we'll see i mean that's certainly a tool as you're saying like we need to we need to poke the, the hornet's nest. This province isn't working. You know, this, this confederation isn't working out well. Like, like an interesting poll recently found that 21% of Ontarians responded saying that they felt their province would be better off outside of Canada. <laughs> well, yeah. if even Ontario has one in five people saying it, we should be reevaluating the entire package. And, and uh, it will take nothing less than a constitutional crisis, I think, for the, the powers that, to be to realize that they have to do this. Yeah, yeah, more of a European Union style where the provinces have have a lot more control and, and independence. And and yeah, we can still have our trade agreements if, if they'll cooperate. Um, you know, Corey, what hurts me is the hardship. You know, Alberta, Canada, we have the third biggest oil reserve in the world. I understand we're only the number five producer in the world. So in spite of all the things we've talked about ad nauseum, our great environmental record, our great social record, we're not meeting our potential. We have the third biggest and we're producing at number five. Um, I'm at a stampede breakfast a couple days ago and I'm talking to some oil and gas workers who take risk and work as hard as anybody who, who, who are having a little trouble still getting, you know, getting their equipment out, getting their jobs out, getting their skills out. And it's because we're not at full capacity. And, uh, and we all know the pipeline situation, uh, you know, Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion is virtually stalled. Energy East is non-existent. It goes on and on. And, and let's get our people back to work. And, and you know, and then we, when you look at the Canadian situation, how anti-competitive we are. Of course, we saw the Rogers, uh, you know, burnout the other day and all the problems that that caused. Uh, you look at all the money that the Canadian government is borrowing 
And what that has done to our, our interest rates now, plus the money they printed, let's get a government that cares about, about balancing their, their budgets so banks will be more in tune with giving uh, small business uh, more competitive advantages. Um, you know, the, the just so many things in Canada that, uh, that could be better and, and don't match our values. Uh, again, Alberta values of hard work, risk-taking, and, and, and sharing the benefits. Um, you know, we're, we're living in this high-tax world, uh, in, and most of it to, to Ottawa, where we don't get value. It just seems like we're almost bit bent on economic uh, self-destruction. It, it, it's so frustrating and, and maddening to see. Um, you, you're in a rural constituency. It's a bit dry out in Medicine Hat, but there's a lot of ranching and some agriculture. And that uh, an issue that's been coming up, we're seeing around the world, of course, in, in uh, the Netherlands or Sri Lanka, uh, the latest environmental push. I mean, they haven't stopped now with oil and gas. They're going after fertilizers. And that's really uh, causing well pressure on consumers and the agricultural community. Uh, are there any concerns about those? Because there's a proposed fertilizer reduction in Canada coming down the lines too. Are, have you been hearing about that on uh, your ground level? Oh yeah, people people here here are very concerned. Uh, we're fortunate to have irrigation uh, west of town, and uh, the, you know those those crops are. are those acreages are very productive. Yeah, there, there's huge concern. But but you know, but look what look what happens here, Corey. You know, the the environmentalists go after the oil and gas business. Jason Kenney's war room has been a disaster in, in trying to protect us for that. That should be eliminated. Uh, and then as soon as it, you know, now we're producing number five in the world, even though we're the third biggest. And what do they do? They they turn to to GMO nitrogen and now cattle. Uh, they're they're hard after after what we produce. Um, seems like uh, the environmentalists and those that uh, benefit from a, a different status quo or globalization and, and what the World Economic Forum offers, which is not not in sync with what uh, Medicine Hat and Cypress Medicine Hat needs. Um, yeah, we, we, we have to continue to push back. We have to get as effective as possible. And uh, and more than anything, we, we, we have to speak the truth. But, you know, Corey, we, we need some democratic reform. You know, Jason Kenney disappointed in so many ways, but maybe one of the biggest ways was in not putting in meaningful recall and meaningful citizen initiated uh, legislation laws. Yeah, he put things in that are, are maybe just being proclaimed now, but, but the signatures that are required to put things on the ballot, unlike Switzerland, where the Swiss people can actually overturn a federal law or, um, or put in a law with a, with a referendum and a petition, uh, he didn't do that. He made the bar way, way too high. So, so we need to, to fix that democratic reform, Corey. We need to put in a system where if our politicians won't do it for us, the people need to be able to get rid of them or through initi citizen-initiated referendums do it themselves. No, I'm with you. I mean, I was very disappointed in that. I mean, we worked, as you said, when we were in the Wild Rose together uh, on things such as Citizens Initiative and, and Recall. And there was a lot of policy discussions and we knew same sort of thing. You have to set a bar. You don't want to recall held every time somebody's elected and, and you don't want a referendum every time somebody's fighting over a property line with a neighbor. But you have to make it achievable. And they yeah. purposely put it way out of reach. Yeah, 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 way out of reach in the number of signatures. And if I remember right, in the citizen initiative, he even put in a kind of a poison pill. If somebody starts a, a, a ballot, a citizen initiative uh, referendum question, and it doesn't achieve the bar, it isn't successful, nobody else can do it for five years. Uh, and I mean, so so can somebody start one just with the aim to sabotage? And, and the bar is so high anyway, it, uh, it, it's, it's next to impossible. Um, but but let's you know, I understand Switzerland, 8.4 million people, 50,000 people can sign a petition forcing a, a referendum to overturn any new federal government law. The main benefit I, I hear, Corey, is it, it forces the politicians to really, really consult before they put in any laws. Uh, who, you know, because, of course, they don't want laws overturned either. Uh, you know, why don't we put in these these, you know, important uh gatekeepers and these important things to stop at these these benchmarks and uh, instead you know we we you know again like it, it's it's uh when i think of how much change our system needs the fact that 2011 2012 you and me were running around saying all these things and here we are 2022 and and we've we're still talking about it uh ho hopefully the next two or three years will be more successful 
Yeah, well, on the bright side, we haven't given up yet. We're stubborn, if nothing else. Uh, so before I, I, I let you go, and I, like I said, I appreciate that, and I, I like being able to talk to you because uh, at least there's, there's disadvantages, of course, being stuck in an independent role, but there's advantages in, in being unrestrained, of course, and you can just speak to to what you want to feel, or you know, you're not worried about a party at this point. Uh, so just where can people find information on what you're up to and where you're communicating, and uh, you know, just your your constituency in general. Yeah, thank you, Corey. Yeah, please, Cypress Medicine Hat, uh, Drew Barnes uh, on Facebook and Twitter and, 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 and the website under Drew Barnes is Cypress Medicine Hat. And Corey, what we're really fighting for hard the next little while is Alberta first, economic freedom and individual opportunity. Um, you know, the fact that, you know, taxes are so high in Canada, taxes are so high, high in Alberta, um, it's time to get get back to where people have the opportunity to work hard, take risk, and then share, share, share their results. Um, this, this, this is, this is a little bit of a, of a detour, but Johnny Goudreau signed with uh, Columbus yesterday. Uh, taxes, state tax in Columbus is 3.9% uh, in, in Ohio. There's a small, I think 2% tax in a Colum in Columbus. Alberta and Canadian taxes are as high as 48%. So was it a factor in his decision? You know, I don't know uh, how, how many businesses don't we get because there's nine American states with no no income tax. Uh, taxes are lower in many, many places around the world, never mind our gatekeepers and our regulation. So, Corey, please join me in a fight for economic freedom, individual op opportunity and Alberta families. Right on. Thanks, Drew. I'll keep fighting the good fight. And I hope your medicine hat uh, rodeo goes excellently. And uh, I hope we can talk again soon. We will. Corey, thank you. Have a good one. Great. Thank you. So that was Drew Barnes, and he is the independent member for Cypress Hills Medicine Hat. Like I said, those con conversations are great, you know, to get somebody when they're independent. Uh, not that Drew was ever restrained when he was in a party either, actually. He was always quite outspoken. That's part of why uh, he ended up uh, in an independent role, but, but all the same... Uh, you know, there, there's constraints. You're going to feel a little restrained when you're in a party role and, and you might hold back on some things. And Drew is just uh, speaking to what he feels is, is best for Alberta and constituents. And I appreciate that. All right. looks like we should be ready to cut to uh, Melanie Risden. She's out on the stampede grounds again and we'll just do a live hit out there. I believe she's talking to a real cowboy, uh, unlike a fake one like myself. <laughs> yes, Corey, we are talking to a real cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ross Knight is uh, joining us right now. He's one of the chuck wagon racers for this year. Uh, how long have you been doing this actually, Ross? Oh, like 40 years. 40 years. Okay. Well, so he's very experienced cowboy. <laughs> now you are an Albertan. Well, actually Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan so, yeah. so where are you from? Uh, St. Walbert, just outside of Lloydminster. So, okay. And we're standing in front of Ross's, um, wagon, wagon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. uh and uh and so tell me a little bit about the design of the wagons first of all and and um anything special about them uh so all the wagons got to weigh 1325 uh pounds and stuff with the driver in them and yeah most of them are still traditional wheels and hubs and stuff right so yeah um, okay yeah and so tell me how many uh, how many horses like how how is uh everything kind of constructed when you're out on the on the racetrack <laughs> racetrack sorry so yes we use six at a time right four in the yeah. wagon and two out riding horses we have uh, 16 horses here so we alternate them every other night and run them that way and yeah so no it's been going really good and I saw yesterday, uh, I think you came eighth and then sixth yeah. the day before you're racing again tonight. Do you pretty much race every day? Uh, yeah, we race all 10 days through Stampede. So uh, that's why we switched the horses back and forth. They got to certain rules that they can only go so many times and so many days in a row and stuff. So. And you've done the Stampede for many years. Have you come out as the big winner? Uh, no, we've never won it, but one of these years we will. Yeah, and then where do you head after Stampede? Uh, we're going to High River and then Strathmore and then up to Dawson Creek and then back to Rocky and Century Downs. It must be really nice to have everything sort of back up and running now. I mean, you must have been kind of putting things on hold for a while. Um, well, actually, we raced wagons every year, even through COVID. Uh, we raced around home and stuff. Um, it was just, um, yeah, so we've actually been going all the way through so it's been good so. but it's nice to be back with everything going on here 
Yeah, for sure. We're going to go into uh, the stables, uh, the barns here, and we're going to check out some of the uh, horses that you're traveling with. Oh, okay. And uh, we also have a nice big dog. What's your dog's name? Uh, Rod. Yeah. He's yeah. My daughter's dog. So he comes and hangs out for the 10 days we're here. Nice. Big bull mastiff. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And this is Phil. So Phil's one of the left leaders. He's just turning right. 14, and I've had him since he was seven, maybe. So uh huh. He's going to go tonight. Right? And he likes chasing Rye to see if he can bite him. It looks like he's looking for a snack. He is. <laughs> he likes peppermints and carrots. So. Nice. And okay. This guy over here is Louie. This is who? Lou. All right. Yeah. He's going to go tonight, too. Yeah. So is there any Anything special you do with the horses on the days that they're going to run? Um, not. Looks like perhaps our service might be getting a little bit limited in there. Either those we horse take burn. the feed away and stuff a couple hours before we race and yeah. things like that. And um, everybody else gets... We'll come out of the barn, Corey. Uh, our signal is getting a little bit cut off, I think, in here. Um, so... Ross, tell me a little bit about some of the changes that they've done this year uh, for the races. Um, actually, so they put up the, these pylons and stuff. It, it seems to be working really well. Like, um, nobody's had any complaints about it. And went down to 27 wagons and three to a heat, which is good, I guess, yeah. uh, for safety safety reasons, right? So. Yeah. And are you happy with the changes? I mean, obviously, everyone is, uh, is wanting to make sure that people are and the animals are yeah. in their safest environment. Uh, yeah, I think they're doing what's the best for the sport. So it's been good so far. Okay, what is your, what's your favorite thing about uh, coming to the Stampede? Uh, actually the race in the wagon. It's, it's just fun. I just enjoy it and done it all my life and I just really like it. So. And do you have family members that are, uh, uh, that are kind of following yeah. in your footsteps? Um, no. Um, my son and daughter both went and got careers, but they do come back and help. My son outrides on the side. And yeah, so the whole family's here for the week, so. Very cool, so a real cowboy for sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we're wishing you luck for tonight's race. Well, and uh, and we'll keep an eye on your numbers as you uh, get through the weekend and we'll see how you do. And Corey, we are gonna see if we can find uh, something interesting to, uh, fill you in on uh, as we're down on the ground. So we'll see you in a bit. Great. Make Rob eat a cricket. I know he can do it. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, so we send our wishes uh, for a good ride tonight as well. Right. Did you get in the picture? <laughs> uh, ride that dog almost. All right. Oh, no kidding. So <laughs> oh, there we go. Thanks, Mel. I'll talk to you a little later. He doesn't want to go home when it's time to go home. <laughs> All right, so that was our Melanie Risden down on the grounds, and it is that special week. That's why I'm wearing this hat. And as I said, I've, I've got enough humility to admit I'm not a real cowboy. I, yeah, I'm an outdoors guy. I live rurally. I mean, I worked surveying for over 20 years. I encountered a lot of people uh, on ranch land or farmland, so I'm familiar with it more than your average city person. But I, aside from cosplaying for the Stampede, won't pretend that I am some sort of cowboy. The chuck wagons, though, uh, just for those, I mean, I see there's people watching from across the country. Uh, it, it is a huge event. It's been held at the Stampede, of course, for, for decades. It's big, and, and they do a circuit throughout the West. It's kind of a, a play on tradition. It, you know, the, the chuck wagon was the wagon that would feed the guys during a cattle uh, drive, and the way that would work is a horn goes. you got to go around some barrels. As a crew has to load a stove. I think now it's more of a symbolic stove, but even the old days, yeah, a heavy stove would have to go in. You get it loaded. These wagons would race, they would run with their teams of horses and outriders. There'd be a couple of horses riding outside too, and you all have to finish well. It, it's a very excited sport. A lot of, uh, there's been some controversy. You know, some horses have gotten injured over the years. Uh, some horses have been put down. Uh, every, you know, the last few stampedes, I think a, a handful have, have um, you know, been injured or died. Uh, people, it's, a, it's tough. You know, I mean, it, it, if it's totally benign, it's kind of makes for a boring sport, but nobody wants to see the animals hurt either. So as Melanie was saying, this year, they, they made some pretty big changes. They, they've changed uh, the number that are in there. They've changed how they ride. They've changed, uh, um, they put different bumpering, I think, on some of the, the infield and things like that to try and keep the horses safe. 
And uh, yeah, Lynn saying, uh, you know, uh, yeah, the trucks are great on TV, but much better in person where you can pet the horses and smell the smells. And yeah, if you go to, uh, the, you know, the Stampede Grounds, there, there's the Agricultural Center too. I don't know if you get so much to the chuck horses, they kind of keep those guys in a different barn, but there's the whole Agricultural Center and you can interact if you're not familiar with uh, rural living and wildlife. Well, wildlife domestic animals it's all down there and you can check it out there was even a i found a, a beekeeping thing from the beekeepers association you know and i'm a first year beekeeper trying to figure things out so i was pretty fascinated with the delay display in that so you know take it in there's a bit of an attitude you get from you know hipsters and, and some of the usual suspects in calgary oh we're ashamed of the stampede and oh we don't like dressing like hillbillies every year and oh it's an embarrassment of the city ah go away then go go move to vancouver live in toronto this is a thing we've been having for a long time. It's a fun thing. It's kind of being a bit small town while you are in the middle of a big city. And that's why we're checking in and we're dressing up this week. Because you know what? we got to relax and live a little and enjoy ourselves a little. Uh, you know what? I'm going to mention something that I just wrote down for one of my notes, too. It got me wound up on Twitter. I just, I just want to talk about people's attitudes and part of our problems and a human nature problem. So there was a, a Vice magazine or whatever. Vice is a you know online publication sort of thing. They're very left-leaning. They are independent, kind of, so I'll give it that. You know, I, I, hey, I support all independent media, left or right. But they had this, this snotty column from a guy, and it's right on their tweet, too, saying, you know, if you drink milk, there's something wrong with you. And he goes on about, if I look at somebody and I see a grown person drinking milk, I'm just disgusted. I mean, what are you, a child? And, and it just went on and on and on about the, the horrors of why somebody would drink milk. Whatever. I don't drink milk straight up. It's not for me. Not a big thing with me. I, I don't mind it in all sorts of ingredients and foods or cereal even, but I don't. But I've got no problem with other people who do. And that, this is what I'm talking about, the human nature problem. You can disagree with somebody, but not have to go off about it. Just don't drink milk then. How hard is this? But no, this is the difference between a lefty and a right winger. This is the difference between a conservative and a libertarian, you know, or people in general and lefties. You don't like it, don't do it. But no, they have to peek over the fence and tell somebody else, I don't like it, thus you must not do it either. That is a real problem. That's when humans get on each other's cases. That's when you get conflict. That's when you get dispute. We've got to learn. And, and hey, it's not just the left who do it. There's lots of people who are guilty of it. In the old days, it was religious busybodies who were telling people what to do. And again, if you want to be you know, a person of faith and, and, and stick heavily and, and you know, strictly to the tenets of your faith, by all means. But if somebody else isn't interested in it, leave them alone. And that's where we've gotten to the point where we, we no longer, you know, illegalize, uh, you know, people, same-sex couples and things like that. It, it's a good development. It's just, it just quit worrying about what the other person's doing. But that vice thing, it was just so snotty and high horse and like, oh, you know, you are a bad person because you're doing something I don't like. So what? So what? Get over it. So yeah, same thing with the local hipsters. Don't like dressing up like uh, Western. Don't like the rodeo. Don't like the stampede. Fine, don't go. It's not that hard. Nobody's forcing you. I mean, I, I, I talked a little while ago about the difference between Klondike Days in Edmonton and the difference of stampede. Klondike Days is a good time. It's a big gathering and everything else. But it doesn't have that feel like the stampede. The stampede is unique. The whole city gets going. You know, clowns like me dress up in Western wear. Uh, people all over get involved in a lot of things. The city, the bars, the, the musical act. It's, it's a whole cultural thing. And it, I don't want to lose it. If, if all of that stuff is gone, then the stampede does become just another fair. And hey, we've got thousands of those. Every city or town has a fair. This one's unique. It's different. And uh, Ashley uh, asking, do you got cowboy boots to go with the hat? No, I don't. As I said, I'm a poor Albertan when it comes to that. I, I, I bought the Western wear. I grew up in Banff. And, uh, you know, it's not exactly a cowboy town, though it is an Alberta town. And, uh, you know, I've been in Calgary for 20 years now down in Pritis. I should own Western wear, but again, it's just this year I finally got some of it going. But the boots, no, I haven't gotten that far. They're very expensive, and if I'm only going to wear them one week or a year, it's not quite worth it. But, hey, I got a hat. We'll see next year. All right, I'm going to talk to uh, about one of our sponsors before I get on to our next guest. And that is the Canadian Shooting Sports Association. Uh, just that reminder, speaking of, you know, as I was talking about, I was talking about leaving people alone. If you're not into something... Good for you. Just let the other person do it. Well, that applies a lot when it comes to firearms, too. A lot of people don't like firearms, don't want to own firearms. Well, good for you. But leave the law-abiding firearm owners alone. But that's not the way it's working. They're coming after your firearms. They're coming after your property. They want to take it away. 
And you don't have to, you shouldn't have to justify why you own them anyways. If you're a law-abiding person, it's nobody else's business but your own, whether you're target shooting, collecting, hunting, your business. But right now it's under threat. The federal government wants to take away your firearms. The only way you're going to defend yourself is organizing, getting together, and pushing back. And that's what the Canadian Shooting Sports Association is all about. They also provide resources, by the way, as a, for a firearm owner, like any other association or club, links to events, uh, links to news stories. But most of all, what's really important right now is pushing back, standing up for firearm owners and lobbying. And you've got it, safety in numbers. You've got to get together for this. If you, if you own firearms or you're planning on it, or you just support firearm owners, you got to join these guys. The membership's very reasonable. Get on there. Canadian Shooting Sports Association. Take out a membership. It's cssa-cila.org, and it's uh, worth it. It's an investment in yourself and your rights. Okay, let's bring in David Clement from the Consumer Choice Center. I, I'm looking forward to it. I haven't had David on for a while. He's been on the show a number of times, though, and uh, consistently free enterprise and free consumer choice, as the name of the uh, organization indicates. Hey, David, how's it going? It's going well. How are you? Good, good. Thanks. So, uh, yeah, what brought me in this time, and I, I think it was Melanie, actually, who did that story, was talking with you uh, uh, about domestic airline rates. I mean, we're, hitting, mm -hmm. we're getting hit hard. We're getting hit with inflation. We're getting all sorts of problems. Uh, but airline fares in, in particular are somewhere in Canada. Where we're not getting a very good deal. No, no, uh, we aren't getting a good deal. Um, I mean, pre-COVID, the numbers were particularly poor. If you look from Paris, we were 60th globally in terms of the arcs per 100 kilometers traveled was 2.1 times higher than the U.S., 2.8 times higher than New Zealand, and 3.6 times higher than that. So not very, not very good. Yeah, sorry, you're breaking up a bit. Uh, for some challenging internet there. What David was getting, what I kind of got pieces of there, is uh, uh, basically we're paying as much as double or triple for some of our domestic airfares that, uh, compared to comparable other countries right now. And uh, I think, well, as per the article, uh, we'll bring David back in and see if it's uh, kind of tuned up a little. Uh, it was part of the problem just due to a lack of competition. We don't have uh, a good variety, and we're not allowing foreign uh, air operators to, to do domestic flights in Canada. Yes, I'm sorry about the, the connection there. I, I think it should be better now. Um, yeah, so one of the solutions or one of the, one of the problems is that we don't have very much competition in the space uh, because it's not actually legal for an international carrier to fly between two Canadian cities with passengers. Um, so British Airways is not allowed to fly Vancouver to Toronto en route to London. And I think when you, when you, say that to people most people scratch their heads and they go okay well why why is that prohibited um and so one the first step i would take is allowing for international carriers to fly domestic routes um in many senses they have to fly over these places anyway if they're traveling across the country so let american airlines fly vancouver to seattle on or uh, vancouver to calgary on route to boston or uh, Air France from uh, Montreal to Halifax en route to Paris. Um, the, the amount of routes that you could throw in that scenario are endless, and that would add a, a, some additional competition and hopefully some down, down the pressure on prices. Well, yeah, and I mean, it just makes sense. If the flight particularly happens to be going that anyway, that route anyways, I mean, perhaps it's, it's just a domestic hop, but you might as well fill those seats. I mean, you think even the, the green crowds just report this. We want to be as efficient as possible when we move people. Exactly. Absolutely. So um, the other thing that I think needs to change is the foreign ownership restrictions on Canadian companies. And so what that means is that uh, our domestic airlines have to have a certain percentage owned by Canadian investors. And the reason why that's a problem is it limits the, the pool in which they can seek out investment to, let's say, expand their fleet, buy new planes, hire more people, provide better service, all of the things that consumers are uh, irritated about right now. Um, so I think it would be reasonable to allow for them to increase that share. And if they want to attract money from uh, from around the world, they should be free to 
do so while at the same time ensuring that they have to compete against international carriers if international carriers want to operate here. So is some of the difficulty though, like country to country, like can a Canadian airline could say a WestJet flight stop in Dallas and then perhaps uh, do a, a flight to Oklahoma and drop some people off before coming back to Canada or, or is it just here? So most countries um, have these laws. Um, in some instances, so in Europe, several of several countries have these laws, but most travel within Europe by plane is from country to country. Um, but that doesn't mean that all countries do this. In fact, Chile um, doesn't have any of these restrictions whatsoever. So any carrier who wants to fly um, in Chile between two cities can. And I think that that's a useful model for, for us and yes, other countries like the United States will have restrictions, um, but I think that that's okay. Not that they have the restrictions, but that we go the other way. Uh, we shouldn't shoot ourselves in the foot because American policymakers are shooting themselves in the foot. Oh, I'm with you there. I mean, that's often the excuse used for protecting, you know, policies like supply management and such, uh, you know, point to subsidies and things somewhere else and say, well, we've got to do it too. And, in the end, we all just lose. I mean, if, if we put good policy in here, it'll put pressure on the people in the other countries to improve their policy elsewhere. So, I mean, it's not a reason to stop. No, no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. And and the people who benefit from this the most are Canadian consumers who are either trying to travel domestically or travel abroad. I mean, it's pretty ridiculous that you can fly from Toronto to Madrid, Toronto to Paris for significantly less than you can fly from Toronto to Winnipeg or Toronto to Calgary, even though the distances, um, the distance to Europe is shorter. Uh, and so that really leaves you scratching your head as to why is this the way it is and how can we make this better? And obviously everything we've seen with airports and delays and cancellations and all of the chaos that we've seen at airports, I think further highlights the need to make these changes as soon as possible. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just gonna pivot to something else too that kind of occurred mm -hmm. uh, kind of up your alley anyways with, uh, and, and I'll segue because you know, there's a little bit of connection problem, but it's gotten a bit better, is that uh, we don't have a heck of a lot of options with internet service. And boy, did we ever learn that quickly when Rogers went down for uh, 15 hours one provider basically brought the company, the country to its knees in a sense uh, over a 15 hour period. I mean, my view on it is it's due to a lack of competition and alternatives. Yeah, absolutely. It is because of a lack of competition. Um, I remember back in the Stephen Harper days, there was so much um, hoopla and fear mongering over the prospect of Verizon entering the Canada mar the Canadian market. Um, and they never ended up coming, uh, which is a huge disservice to us. I mean, how many times, and th I mean, this is a bit of a joke, but I'm sure that anybody watching this will resonate with them. How many times have you needed service for your internet? You call one of the big three companies. They give you a service window that's between 9 and 5 p.m. They knock twice while you're in the shower, and they leave and tell you they got to come back next week. Um, that is not good service and the only reason why that's tolerable is because there's nowhere else to go um there there is there are so few options that there's just not enough competition uh for these companies to compete on service uh, and that's not including competing on price i mean we pay more per gig um on cell phone plans than than almost any other comparable country whether it be the united states europe australia etc uh, and so we're really putting the bill for this bad policy. Yeah, and I mean, you know, cell phone coverage, internet coverage, these aren't luxuries any longer. I mean, they're really a large part of our life now. They're, they're like a utility, you know, in the past, uh, like a phone line or or even your, your heat. And so, I mean, you won't die without those things, but they're pretty integral to your working life now and, and your, just your connection to the world. So. I mean, we should be wanting is, is as much diversity and service as, as possible. But I, I'm not seeing much indication we're working that way. I hear a lot of voices after the Rogers breakdown of people saying this is why we need the government to intervene even further, and, and it worries me because they're going to get they're going to make things worse. No, yeah, I, I I think the calls for like a public provider are really silly. 
I mean, the pandemic showed uh, that the government is good really at one thing. It's very good at one thing, and that is distributing cash. Um, outside of that, the government does not compete well with the private sector. Um, I mean, whether you're renewing your license uh, or you're going to a passport office, it would be best if we avoided uh, having an internet provider run by the same entity that has people camping out overnight to get a piece of government identification. Um, so no, I don't think that the government further involving itself or some sort of public carrier is the right way to go. If, it, if the government's going to get involved, what they should be doing is reducing or removing the barriers that prevent that competition and prevent um, prevent uh, other companies, predominantly from the U.S., but it could be from anywhere, from entering the market. Um, this will be especially true um, as Starlink, Elon Musk's uh, satellite internet company, in, in layman terms, um, continues to grow, and if it really takes off, that could be a good disruption for the Canadian market, especially for rural Canadians. A lot of the conversation about internet services for um, rural and indigenous folks, um, because the one, the options are terrible, and in many instances, there are no options or services just so terrible you're using satellite phones. Uh, and so I'm hopeful that that type of disruption, so long as we don't prevent it, um, can chip away at this a little bit. Um, but whatever the barriers are in place that prevent that type of disruption and competition, those need to be evaluated and those need to be scaled back. Oh, absolutely. And, and just on that note, like I, I live in Prentice just outside of Calgary and our internet service since we moved out there has been horrible. I, I, I'm a 10 minute drive from a city of a million people and we couldn't get it. We got Starlink two months ago and it's been a, a life changer. Like it, mm -hmm. it was high speed internet, just like city people. Uh, we're not going back. There's, there's no, well, not by choice anyways. And uh, yeah, as you said, I mean, these guys, there's a void being left by this lack of competition, this poor service. Uh, hopefully some of these new players will come in and shake that up and then make it better for us all. It's probably why my connection has been so choppy. <laughs> well, like I said, it was a good segue to bring it in anyways, because yeah, it is difficult. We should catch up with the world on that and it's just getting so important. So, uh, I, you know, before I let you go, then thanks for joining me. You know, uh, you cover these issues consistently, of course, in general. I know your your answer to most things, uh, as is mine, is just allow consumer choice, more competition. It's kind of a proven formula when it comes to just about every industry. So where can people find more information on what you guys are up to? Because you're always putting out, you know, new reports and things such as that. Yep. And uh, appreciate it. Yeah, consumertricecenter.org. You can follow me on Twitter at, at Clement Liberty. Uh, well, you'll, you'll see everything I'm doing, everything I'm writing. Um, and, uh, yeah, check that out and, and follow and, uh, support us if, uh, if you care about consumer choice. Excellent. Well, thank you for coming on to talk to us today, David. And, uh, and also, you know, reference people over to that story that Melanie Risden wrote where she spoke with uh, David on the airline issue. And, and again, I encourage folks to have a look because you guys put some great stuff out just to remind folks that you're not necessarily getting a good deal on a whole lot of consumer items and, uh, you might want to pay attention. So I, uh, hope to talk to you again down the road, David. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hey, thanks. Yeah, that's David Clement of the Consumer Choice Center. You know, their, their name says it, right? And uh, yeah, follow them on Clement Liberty or uh, consumerchoice.org. Unfortunately, yeah, that internet was frustrating, but it's worth talking about. Here we are in this developed country, this this country that's supposed to be uh, wealthy, and, and still we can't seem to get decent uh, internet service to a whole lot of areas. And I know years ago when I was working in the States, they were always ahead of us. I mean, uh, because of the roaming charges where they would just ruin us, Phoebe Long, sorry, I get distracted by comments, Phoebe Long saying, bring back Alberta government telephone? Oh, God, no. I hope that's a sarcasm statement or something going back. No, 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 we don't want government taking over again. As David was saying, they can't even renew our passports. We don't need that back. We need more options. And the Americans were way ahead of us. Uh, so what I would do when I'd work in the States at first, because I couldn't get a decent roaming plan. They, I mean, you could end up spending thousands. Ask Fabio, uh, uh, what's his name, Lukasik, and uh, he used to be an Alberta minister. He traveled to Poland, and I think he nailed the taxpayers with it was a $15,000 roaming bill or something or even more. 
It's ridiculous. And I would go down and I would actually, the first thing I do when I get on a contract is go into a Walmart and buy a flip phone with a data card and just apply it to it. Because it was way cheaper just to buy a new burner, essentially, every time I went to work in the States than to try and convert my TELUS one to Roam and get down there. Now it's improved. I can go to the States without getting hit so hard like that. But uh, it, it, we were years behind, and we're years behind with these airfares. It is ridiculous that I can fly to Amsterdam cheaper than I can fly to Toronto. Now, admittedly, I'd rather go to Amsterdam than go to Toronto, so it's a better deal as far as that goes. But, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we're getting it badly as, as consumers. It's not serving us well, and uh, we, we've got to work on that. So it uh, looks like Melanie's getting prepared for another hit there out in the field. And I see a thumbs up from Rob who's out there with her. So let's pop on and do one more check-in from the Stampede Grounds and see what's yes. happening out there. Hey, Mel, what are you doing now? Okay, well, we are at Polini's Concession. This is where they are serving hot dogs. They're special hot dogs, Corey. They have mealworms. Oh. Uh, so we've got Martin here. Martin is from, where are you from? From the Netherlands. So he's from the Netherlands and he is our brave volunteer because I am unfortunately not brave enough to give this a try. So we've got Martin, one of these hot dogs, and Martin is going to give it a try. He also said he is willing to try the actual mealworms that they sprinkle on top of the hot dogs. Well, so you are going to let us know how this goes. What's that, Corey? Well, I was saying, you know, my wife is from Friesland, her family in the Netherlands, and she's one of the fussiest eaters I know. So I, I'm glad there's an example of somebody with more courage here. <laughs> yes, I agree, so that I don't have to try it. Um, so the, the mealworms are sort of embedded inside the hot dogs. Do you even taste it? I don't really notice them, no. Okay, you don't notice it. So it tastes okay so far. Yeah. And you are willing to try those crispy critters on their own, hey? Have you ever eaten a mealworm? No, I don't. No, never. Show it to you. All right, go ahead. Yep. <laughs> it's nice. It's, it's nice. <laughs> it's a bit salty. It's like a normal potato chip. It's like a potato chip. So are they cr like crunchy? Yeah, very crunchy. Yeah. Huh, are they salty? Yes, they're salty. Yeah, I would imagine you'd want to throw salt on those... Uh, crispy critters it's nice, it's nice. Yeah. so so are you like going to be a mealworm convert maybe yeah it's good huh. all right martin is a mealworm convert today um now it's uh how long have you been in Can canada um, this is the second day we came uh, yesterday we're visiting family here in calgary so second day here okay and uh, so that's awesome, and you and obviously plan to come to the Stampede, Stampede because it's the greatest outdoor show on earth. Have you gone on any rides or anything yet? No rides, but we went to the dog and pony race. It was fun. Yeah. Awesome, great. And uh, what else are you going to get up to today? We're trying the monster motor thing. I don't know exactly what it is. I think it's race bikes or something. We're going to check that out. Well, welcome. And I hope you have a great time here at the Stampede. I really hope you continue to enjoy your mealworm um, hot dog. And my suspic suspicion is that you're going to be seeing more of these around the world, probably coming to Europe very soon. Okay. All right. Forward to them. <laughs> enjoy. Now, we were going to just check in with uh, these guys here and just see how busy their booth has been. So, uh, what's your name? Ava. And Ava, how busy has your booth been here with uh, people ordering these mealworm hot dogs? Uh, pretty busy, actually. Because a lot of people, like, when we sample them, they would try them and they would actually really like them. So. And what are your thoughts? I personally haven't tried the hot dog, but I've tried the mealworms and they actually taste pretty good. What do they taste like to you? What do you compare them to? Kind of roasted peanuts or like the spit sunflower seeds. You are a brave girl. That's awesome. Okay. Well, apparently it's been busy here. So, uh, yeah, I guess if you're going to head down to the Stampede, you're going to have to come by the booth. It's over by the uh, by the um, Nashville North tent right across the way. And uh, you can grab yourself some mealworms and a mealworm hot dog. Well, I will be partaking. Well, thanks for checking that out. And uh, again, thanks to Martin to, to being that uh, test subject to, to prove, uh, at least from his perspective, they aren't so bad. 
Yeah, I'll leave it to him. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Melanie. Uh, we'll we'll talk after uh, after you get back to the studio then or the. Uh, Sounds studio. great. All right. That's our Melanie Risden down the Stampede Grounds. As we were saying, we knew we were going to look into those uh, uh, worm dogs or whatnot. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, Rob and Melanie were not willing to uh, volunteer and try them out. And uh, she, she found Martin from the Netherlands and, and he gave it a crack and he says they're okay. Uh, I'll take his word for it. You know, I mean, that's one of those things too. That's, he's down there, he's having fun. I was just ranting, you know, a little bit earlier about the Stampede and the value of it and how fun it is and things like that. And it's good to see international visitors coming out and, and enjoying himself. He was saying, you know, he's looking at the dogs and things like that. Uh, Jet Gorgon saying, did that sign say 20 bucks for a hot dog? I didn't catch that. But, you know, uh, midway prices, uh, sometimes it, it wouldn't shock me. And, you know, the, there's two. I talked about that the other day, too, because I know some people. We do have this weird push. Uh, and, again, yeah, it probably is tied to, tied to the you know World Economic Forum type nutcases and, and those kind of people. To make us eat bugs, I mean, we're subsidizing a cricket farm in Ontario and another one's opening in Alberta, which again, if people want to eat them, go to town, hell, go out in the, the, the side of the road and dig your nose into an anthill and, and snort them for all I care. Again, it gets back to, hey, if that's what you're into, you do it. Just don't ask my tax dollars to go towards it. And don't try to say I can't eat other foods because I don't want that stuff. The difference with the stampede thing, though, isn't people pushing bug consumption or the green lunatics saying we got to move on to alternative proteins or anything. It's just fun. They've been doing that sort of thing at the Stampede Midway for decades. You know, like I said, I seem to remember a scorpion pizza they put out one year and you could see those gross little things baked into the pizza and people would just have fun. You know, again, kids, I'll dare you to eat it or whatnot or eat it once. One of the things I did when I came back from the Arctic one year well, no, that wasn't when I came back from the Arctic. I took Jane to Darson. Okay, you just get my memories mixed up. I got on time off from Inuvik, and they, I, I went to Dawson um, for a few days, which back in those days was really stupid. You know, okay, he's going a little crazy. He's been in camp too long. Go to Dawson and take a few days off. What are you going to do in Dawson in March? I tell you what, you drink your face off for three solid days. I came back to camp way more tired and worn out than when I'd uh, left it and, and down a lot of dollars because the booze in Dawson wasn't that cheap. But one of the things I did in one of those bars, I had to do it, was the sour toe drink. And if you look it up, they, they have a, a gross, and they had a number of them, desiccated human toes. They were found, I guess, originally in a jar in like an old miner's cabin. Uh, it's presumed that uh, what had happened, I think it was found in the 70s or something, but that uh, some miner had got major frostbite. Of course, you could lose your digits. He cut his toes off for whatever reason, decided to preserve them in alcohol. And they put it up as a... Uh, you know, just kind of a novelty in the bar up there in the Dawson. I tell you, if you get to the deep north, people are different. They're very different. And uh, somebody started with a dare, you know, oh, well, I dare you to drink a drink with that toe in it. And then they moved it on to, uh, you, you get that toe, they keep it in salt, and uh, they put it in, and, and uh, the, the saying before you bring it down, and there's a guy who makes you do a vow, and you pay him 15 bucks, he's an old trapper-looking fella, is you can drink it fast, you can drink it slow, but your lips have to touch the toe, and you got to drink that back, and the toe has to touch your mouth. And the toe looks horrible. It's all black and dried up and everything, big toenail on it. I did it. I had to. And they give you a certificate saying you've done it. And I think uh, the certificate was numbered too. And I was like the 70,000th person who'd done that. Am I saying everybody should go out and put dead old people's toes in your drinks? No, but there's novelties where you can have fun. And that's similar to these novelty things in the stampede that uh, people do you know, uh, trying out, just having a good time. And if you don't want to, of course, by all means, don't. Oh, it looks like Nico's been Googling. I can see that. There we go. <laughs> there is a sour toe shot right there. That's the toe. That's that thing dried up in a glass there. And uh, if you're going to spend time in Dawson City in the old land of the real Klondike, well, that's uh, one of the things you can do while you're there. I got, I got some pictures of me out there that'll be harder to find, but where I actually did it, but, uh, yeah, Phoebe saying, uh, get enough booze into you, you just might do anything. Yeah, and again, you know, I see I've been there, done that, got their certificate. I wouldn't do it twice. I got one certificate. That's plenty enough. Uh, but, you know, just have fun. Lighten up, folks, you know. They were talking about with those mealworm hot dogs and such. Uh, yeah, but, you know, as some others were saying, hey, what else is in those hot dogs anyways? You don't really want to dwell on that, you know. It's like the old saying, you don't want to see how a sausage is made. It's just sometimes ignorance is bliss. But, uh, you know, lighten up now and then. And, uh, yeah, you know, Phoebe as well saying, yeah, you do anything with some booze in you. And my boozing days are over, so I'm glad I got the, the sour toe in back while I, I could because I don't think I would do that sober. 
Not sure if and when I'm going to find myself up in Dawson again anyways, but it was an experience. And, uh, you know, it's fun. And you'll be able to talk about it for a lifetime and have that anecdote story to tell about you with the sour tome. Uh, Cheryl saying, yeah, Pat King and, and as well, Tamara Leach, is, uh, they both got hearings going on, more court appearances. Uh, these are, you know, again, the convoy organizers who have been locked up, political prisoners. I mean, these are people charged with mischief. Minor, minor things. We've got some very serious issues going on. Serious criminals out there, dangerous people. And we're busy cracking down on, on these guys. And, and Tamara Leach in particular, as I said, there's a, if people are interested, go to Give, Send, Go and uh, look up Tamara Leach. It's right in her name, and that's spelled L-I-C-H. And uh, she's raised about $50,000, I believe, the last time I checked. And, you know, it's, 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 it's important to at least make sure she's not financially suffering. She's probably going to come out of this with a criminal record. She's been locked up, uh, like Drew was saying, you know, already, what, over 40 days even if she was convicted of everything she's been charged with, the sentence will probably be less than what she's already served. It's uh, absurd. It's wrong. It's abuse. And uh, it, it's got to stop. But uh, yeah, bear in mind, maybe help her out so she can uh, pay her bill so at least she doesn't have to, like I said, stay awake at night and wondering how the mortgage is going to go. Uh, somebody mentioned earlier when you're talking about the leadership race that, that uh, Danielle Smith uh well, saying that she's officially in, I think she, she's put the deposit in, she's put the signatures in. There still has to be, I believe, a, a signature or a sign-off from the leader's election committee before it's fully official. That might have already happened. I'm not sure. And uh, uh, I, I don't think they'd be crazy enough to block her run. I, I mean, boy, if you want a revolution within that party, block Smith. But I mean, nothing seems to surprise anymore, especially people who want to cling to the status quo and, and the old guard and the progressive conservatives that we thought we'd flushed out of the government are still clinging into the uh, progressive conservative party under the name UCP right now. There's, there's a battle going on and, and it's being played out in this leadership race. Uh, Sonico asking about the guys in Coots who are still in prison and pushing for court next year. I don't know much about that one. That case is different. And, and that's the main thing. I don't even like tying it to um, the case of the protesters in Ottawa that was kind of, I guess, inspired or related, but at the same time, it wasn't the same. I mean, Leash had nothing to do with that. That's a different group of individuals and uh, whatever they're doing. Yeah, Jet Gorgon, uh, the Coots boys are in jail. Yes, but this was a group of five, I believe five, and they uh, apparently, I don't know the details, so I don't want to go too far into it, but they were found with a bunch of firearms, uh, Kevlar vests, all sorts of other equipment and materials. I think they had somebody inside. It sounds like with the charges... Uh, somebody either was uh, uh, undercover or somebody was was an informant and, and ratted, but they're charged with conspiring to murder police officers. I don't know if there's truth to it. I have no idea and all of that stuff. But if those charges are real and if they're serious, that's unfortunately or whatever way you want to look at. That's the sort of charges that, yeah, a person stays in without bail. That's very potentially dangerous. And I'm not going to speak to who's innocent or not or whatever within that group, but that's totally unrelated to what's going on with Tamara Leash or even uh, uh, Pat King and, and some of the others. That's, that's a different uh, different scene altogether. So I, I can't really, you know, won't comment as much on that. Uh, somebody else mentions John uh, Horsman. He's another person who put himself in um, to the uh, UCP race. It looks like he's going to be entering. I've got him coming in to talk to me next week. He's going to come in studio, I believe, and we'll have an interview with him. Uh, because, yeah, the, the fellow from Amisk, he's, he's out. Uh, he's not uh, running. It was just too high a bar to set it for somebody outside. And uh, it's unfortunate. You know, the more voices, the, the better when it comes to a democratic exercise. And he, he just couldn't make it in. But at least he got out. He got some profile and he, and he spoke to some things. But it's hard to get past those gatekeepers. It's like Drew was saying. It's outrageous. 175,000 to run. That's nuts. And I listen to some fart catchers for the UCP. And I'll start calling them that. The ones who just... Hey, I'm a partisan. I support them and, and blah, blah, blah to the dead end. And, and some of the people know which ones I'm talking about on social media. They're apologists for the BS. And uh, guys, cut it out. You know, <laughs> that bar is unreasonable and it's ridiculous and it's an embarrassment to the party. It's an embarrassment to people who really value grassroots democracy. You don't need it set that high unless you're really trying to shut people out. It's like I said, I think 50 is a good number. That's the sort of thing we had in the past. Most people are not frivolously going to say, yeah, what the hell? I'm going to throw 50,000 on a whim and just run. 
you know, that's the point. It's just to keep the frivolous runs out of there. Plus, keep the, subscri the, the signature bar at 1,000 members. That's fine. That's a lot of work to get 1,000 signatures around the province from people who are actually members of a party. A person is going to have to be serious to get in with that sort of bar. But $175,000, as Drew said, the amount of time wasted and fundraising wasted for all of these candidates when they're out there getting their signatures or, or getting the money raised when they should have been already reaching members, when they should have been out there campaigning, when they should have been listening. Uh, and, and, and it's that much less going into the actual campaign funding. So, I mean, it's, it's when the party does this bait and switch. This is the sort of crap that got Kenny kicked out by his own members and he still doesn't get it. And obviously the party executive still doesn't get it and some other individuals out there. The members have had it with this crap. The members have had it. The, the, the party... Uh, uh, elites, the party, you know, insiders, the top ones. I mean, they couldn't save Kenny. They tried. They got out there. They thought they could get, you know, they, they changed the process, everything with the review, and still barely could get 50%, and he had to step aside. They don't understand their own members, and they're doing it again, and this is a problem. I mean, part of why Kenny got rejected by his members is because he talked big and delivered low, and he took, in some of it, when it comes to the referendum legislation and the Citizens Initiative, it was insulting in the sense, and, and again, I, I liked Kenny. I still do. I'm glad he's out because I think he burned his bridge with the party. I, I still appreciate what he did in the federal front, and I appreciate that he tried to bring the parties together in some other ways. But the, the insult to the intelligence of that legislation that they put out for citizens' initiative and uh, referendums and, and for recall, to put that in there and say, look, I kept my promise, and they give you an impossible legislation to use. That's crap. That's spitting in my face. You might not even, you might as well not even have done the legislation and to put out the crap you guys did. And you knew it. You knew that you put this legislation in in a way that it would be impossible to reach the bar. I can't remember what the numbers are. I think you need 40% or 50% of those who were eligible to vote in the election in order to get, uh, and this is over a limited timeline, in order to get a recall going. Think about that. If you had a low turnout in a constituency, you might need more signatures than the amount of people who even came out to vote in total in order to initiate a recall. That's ridiculous. That's not going to happen. And anybody who's really petitioned before, they know that is not going to happen. And, and people say, oh, I could go on the internet and get a petition and get a thousand signatures overnight. Yeah, I could do that in my Twitter account in a heartbeat. But to get a real one. This is a real petition. This is paper, clipboard, signature, and they got to give you their address. They got to give you their phone number. And uh, to do that, not everybody is willing to do that. They got to be very dedicated. If you're petitioning hard, you might get 100 signatures a day. But when you need 10,000 over the course of a couple months, think of the resources you need to try and initiate. And that's assuming everybody wants that to go. So Kenny pulled stuff like that. He promised this legislation and gave us fake legislation. He promised the, the fair deal panel and sent everybody traveling around in a dog and pony show and barely implemented any of the conclusions that were brought about, which again ticked off the members. They said, look, we took you seriously. We trusted you. We went to these meetings. We told you what we want to see. And you kept kicking the can down the road. You kept pissing around. You kept kissing Ottawa's ass. So we're done with you. I'm speaking on their behalf. I don't have a membership. But when the time came when you said, oh, please support me in my review, and almost half, you know, almost just over half said, no, we're done with you. A lot of that was because you'd already blown too much smoke up their butts and didn't follow through. Where's the Canada pension plan change? You know, where, where's the Alberta pension plan? We said we wanted it. We didn't want more studies. We didn't want more bloody reviews. The Fair Deal panel was the review, the last review. And that's where Albertan said, we want it. And you didn't do it. Where's the Alberta Provincial Police Force? Didn't do it. You know, where's some courage against Ottawa? You didn't show it. And they threw you to the side. And the executive members of the UCP right now still don't understand that. They have that top-down mentality. And they don't seem to understand that the members are going to turn on them again. You got to, you know, when you, when you put out a, a bar like that to run for that party, you obviously don't really want people to vote in it. You don't want them to participate. And uh, it's going to strip, the, it's going to rip the party apart. So if they did anything as insane, though, again, nothing surprises anymore, such as disqualify Smith at this point. Oh, man. <laughs> I mean, the small parties are already having a big battle. I know some people are upset. 
with because uh, I had Paul Heyman on the other day. Look, you can go to the Waldo's Independence Party sites. Uh, a fella sent me some information on now. I guess it's posted on the site of what they feel the offenses were there as to why their 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 executive uh, removed him as a leader or tried to. I mean, it still seems to be in a battle. They have their AGM a week from now. But if you want to take that party and turn it from small to huge, kick Danielle out of the race. <laughs> That'll do it. Uh, I don't think they will, though. It, it would just be too far. But uh, it's an interesting race. It's going to be interesting to see where it goes. And the language coming out of like uh, Howard Anglin with this, this column talking about him, he just ripping into Danielle on every level. And again, this snottiness of it. Oh, she's selling crap. She's selling snake oil. And she's selling to the stupid. That's what she, they're doing is they're telling you you're stupid. They're telling you as a member you shouldn't be taken seriously when you want to push back at Ottawa. Nothing else has worked yet, Anglin. Nothing. Somebody's trying a different approach. And the members like it. And they want it. Don't tell people they're stupid for supporting something you don't agree with because you're not going to draw those supporters in. But you're so desperately clinging to that old guard, to that status quo, and we're sick of it. Albertans are sick of it. UCP members are sick of it. They want something different. And I know you've got your... Uh, you know, establishment candidates running, and they're not necessarily bad. I um, I think Taves is a stand-up person, a good conservative, and so on. But he's also not going to change anything very radically. Maybe people want some radical change. Let the members choose that. That's fine. But don't get so insulting and belittling for the members who don't like that alternative in this race. It's going to be very divisive, and there might not be much left to this party when it's done with if you carry on that way. And, uh, well, there's still a few months left in this race. Unfortunately... I guess that's the way to expose who's a liberal or not when they're losing and they start down the hysteric accusations and character assassinations rather than making out their own policies. Uh, that's the one you don't want to support. All right. That's enough for today. I'm really tired. I had a really long night and early morning. I guess you could say I won't go into the details of that, but it left me nice and crabby for good ranting and everything. I appreciate everybody joining me today. I've got a good show tomorrow. I'm bringing Brian Giesbrecht on again. He's the uh, lawyer uh, or he's a former judge. And he's, he's, he's from Manitoba. And again, he's, he's with the Frontier Center. He's done stuff for the Fraser Institute. He's been very outspoken again on the Indian residential school issue because there's just so much going on. And there was an issue with them getting on his case because he, uh, he, he questioned the orthodoxy on what's happened with these residential schools. And uh, they've attacked him. You know, the other members of the media and uh, columnists and people in the Indian industry are very upset with him. So we're going to talk further. I'm going to carry on with this series. I got a column coming out this weekend from Jaime. Uh, Jaime. Oh, I forget your name. Was it Rosenstein? Ah, no, I've had him on before. He's coming. Up, there's going to be a good column coming on, though. He's, he's really breaking down some things on what may be happening with the, uh, the, the grave sites or alleged grave sites in the Kamloops Residential School. And uh, Maxine Bernier coming. He's going to be in studio tomorrow. So we will uh, have a chat with him, see what's happening on the People's Party of Canada going on again it's hard to get oxygen when you have an alternative party when there's a leadership race going on elsewhere so uh that's what i've got for today guys thank you for tuning in and i'll see you tomorrow morning at 11 30 a.m sharp <laughs>